Good evening, and thank you all for being here tonight for this very important program. I would just like to make sure you know that we have a closed captioning option at the bottom of your screen. Click on the little box with the CC and you'll be able to see captions if needed. I'd like to turn this over to the League of Women Voters Education Issue Specialist, Susan Kayser. Susan's going to put this, this whole program tonight in context and why this is so important and why we're doing this. Susie? Thank you all for being here. Um, a basic principle of the League of Women Voters is that our people have a right to a free public education that provides equal opportunity for all. Our system of public education is the underpinning of our democracy and, and self-rule. And that's why every state constitution provides for a system of public education. Our local school districts make up that system. Each district is governed by a locally elected board of education whose members are caretakers, public funds, and make sure that the schools meet the needs of the community that they serve. Oversight by an elected body sets our public schools apart from charter schools and private schools that are not held at the, to the same standards of quality or transparency or to carrying out the expectations of the community. It's the selected school board governing structure that is essential to the league's commitment to the public system. While school boards make decisions about local policies and practices, they also have to pay attention beyond their borders because they are part of the state system and state policies affect our schools. One outcome of the legislature stripping the State Board of Education of its authority is that our local districts are now going to have to take up that slack in making sure that policymakers understand the impl implications for local school districts and school districts in reality. We need school board members to also build confidence in this critical public institution and to advance support for public education itself. As you know, there is a war being waged on public education that none of us can ignore. It includes ideas that are contrary to the separation of church and state, that fail to respect and include all students, and that deny the truth. More of that battle is being played out at the school district level as candidates whose positions reflect a look backwards run for school board. I raise this concern because school board elections are really, really, really important. And as voters, we are in the best position to affect the outcome of those elections. They are nonpartisan races and gerrymandering is not part of the equation. The results have immediate implications for our communities. We have to pay attention. As voters, we need to be vigilant. Certainly the first step is to be well informed about what school members do. What are their roles and responsibilities? That's the focus for tonight's webinar. We are fortunate the school board school is here to share their deep knowledge of this important issue. Um, I want you to know that um, at the end of, or after tonight's seminar, everyone will receive a follow-up email that's jam-packed full of materials, including the slides from tonight and a tip sheet that we've developed on how to assess and the values of candidates and how to be well prepared to vote. Voting is essential, but being an informed voter is even more important to making that vote count. I'm so pleased at this point to welcome our school board school team, Maya Bird and Alisa Hoffman, and Shaker Heights school board member, Laura Hover. They'll teach us a lot about what we need to know. Thanks. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, so that's a great introduction. Hello uh, and welcome. Thanks for joining us at this session. I'm Maya Bird. I'm the Director of Program and Communications at School Board School. And if you can change your Zoom name to your first name in the city you're joining us from, go ahead and click the three dots in the corner of your screen to do that. At School Board School, we bring together people who think they may want to run for school board and education advocates. We'll chat in a link to our website now. We also have Mia Mustafa from the League and Annie on our team running tech. So if you have any tech problems, go ahead and let her know. We also have Karen Leith and Michael Barron from the League 
monitoring the chat. So they'll be available to answer any questions that you type in if the question comes up during the panel. Our expert guests tonight are Elisa Hoffman and Laura Cover. Elisa Hoffman was elected to the Cincinnati Public Schools Board in 2013, and she led the process to author one of the first equity policies in the country. In 2018, she chose not to run for re-election, and she founded School at School. Laura Cover was elected to the Shaker Heights School Board in 2021, and she currently serves as the board's vice president. She has decades of experience in education, so she's worked as a teacher and then in HR, including as the chief talent officer at Cleveland Metropolitan School District. We're so grateful to have both of them here with us. That's just going to be leading us tonight. We're going to go over real quick some norms for the session. So our sessions are always designed to be interactive, so you're not being lectured to via Zoom. Um, we know you may not want to or even may not be able to interact. And we want to be really quick that it's perfectly fine to just listen. We know you'll get a lot out of the session. And finally, we have a handout for tonight. We're going to be chatting in a lot of links. And we know it can be hard to keep track of all those. So we have them all in that handout for you. You can click on the link in the chat. It'll prompt you to make a copy. You can do that, and you can take it home and keep it forever. So we're going to start with getting all of you involved. So we're going to learn a little bit more about each other as we start our time together. Understanding how the school boards work is important for everyone in the community, not just teachers and students, since school boards make decisions that impact us all. So we'd love to hear about your connection to your school district, and we're going to share a quick poll that's going to ask you just that. I know there may be more than one of these things, but let's pick the primary hat that you're wearing tonight. All right, so we've got a lot of concerned community members here tonight, but a lot of, you know, look at a lot of the categories as well. We're very glad to have all of these. We've also got some school board candidates on the call. Now that we know who's here and how we'll get our work done, we're going to talk about what we want to actually get done. What is the work? Let's talk about the objectives so everyone's on the same page. And these are the things we hope you will know believe and be able to do by the time we are done. So knowing who to go to makes you, oh, that's not the objectives. I am sorry. One moment. So participants will be able to distinguish between the role of a school board which is governance and the district administration's role, which is management. We want you to know what questions you'll ask school board candidates to help determine who you should vote for, and that you'll believe your school board members are representatives of the community and should listen to and value their constituents' input before making decisions. So those are the objectives for tonight, and we're gonna get you involved again already. So talk another poll asking you, how strongly do you agree with those statements? With some of these statements. And we're going to ask you the same thing at the end of the session just to see how much we've learned. So be honest, no one expects you to know all or even any of this yet. That's why you came to this panel. And give just about 10 more seconds so everyone can fill it up. There we go. All right, so we've got a lot of agrees and strongly agrees, and do you somewhat disagree, strongly disagree in there? It's being able to distinguish between the role of the school board and the district administration's role. All right. I'm not going to share that poll. I'm so sorry, Shirley Hollins. She chatted in that yours didn't click. Hmm. 
Okay. No matter what your connection is to your community or how much you know about what we talk about tonight, if you're here, we know it's because you care deeply about education in your community. At School Board School, we've always believed that school boards are critical levers to making change in school districts. But over the past few years, the whole country got a lesson in just how important school boards are. Um, as Susan was saying, they control from a lot of big decisions. And even when they're not making pandemic and equity related decisions, their choices have a huge impact on all of our kids. So they determine the resources our kids get and the kind of opportunities and access our children have. So with that, I'm going to pass the floor to our expert guest, and Elisa is going to start us off. Great. Thanks so much, Maya. And thanks so much, Susan, for framing this conversation tonight. So we are going to um, first dive in by talking about the role of the school board and the role of your district administration. And it's really important for us to start by explaining why this distinction is so important. So, um, so a couple of reasons why we think this is just really important. Okay, so it's really important because as you're thinking about how to advocate for students in your community, you have to know who to go to. So we say all the time at School Board School um, that to be an effective advocate, you can't just know what you're advocating for. You have to actually know who to advocate to, right? Like who actually has the power to change the thing that you want to change? So that's one of the reasons it's really important. Another reason it's important is because it's a school board election year here in Ohio and in lots of other states too. And so as you're deciding who you want to vote for, one of the things you need to listen for is is their platform something they actually have the control to change, right? So, you know, I, I remember just like a couple of years ago here in Cincinnati, there was a candidate who was talking about how um, they wanted to really reform the customer service department. And, you know, if you're a, a constituent and you're like, yes, oh my God, whenever I call customer service, people don't answer, I don't get the right answer. And you're like, that, I care about that, I'm voting for you. Well, as you'll see a little bit later, that's not actually in the control of a school board member. They don't deal with day-to-day -day operations. And so if you vote for that person, you've now given your vote to someone who can't actually do that thing. And so the two, two of the big reasons why this matters is because we think it makes you a more effective advocate and a more informed voter. Okay, it's also really important because it's critical to having well-functioning school districts that everybody knows their role and stays in their lane. So when school board members step out of their lane or within superintendents step out of their lane, it makes it really hard for each other to get their work done. And when that happens, it's hard to make progress for kids. Um, and the last reason really ties into that one. I'm sure you all have heard before, people will always say, we've got to hold our elected officials accountable, right? And like, yes, of course we should hold our elected officials accountable. But if you don't even know what a school board member does, how would you hold them accountable? And so these last two connect because once you know what a school board member is supposed to do, if you see them stepping out of their lane, it is on you to hold them accountable. And so that's why it's really important to understand this role. It's also really important because as Susie said in the beginning, here in Ohio and in lots of places around the country, we've seen our public schools are under attack. And our public schools really are a bedrock of our democracy. So when our public schools are under attack, our democracy is under attack. So if you're going to know how to fight back and fight for public education, you've got to elect people who are going to advocate for and support public education um, and building school systems where every child can thrive. And so that's why we hope you'll leave by the end of the night today understanding what your school board does and doesn't do, and then some good questions to ask candidates. And so we're going to get into it now. Okay, so at the most basic... Your school board governs the district and your administration manages the district. So what that means is that your board determines the what, the big picture, and your administration then determines the how, the day-to-day -day operations of the district. One really important thing is, as it says here at the top, the board and the administration together are gonna co-create the vision and priorities for the district. We want you to remember that because everything else needs to come back to that. Your board and administration have to have a clear vision and clear priorities for your district. And then the board is going to establish the policies and the fiscal practices in line with that. 
and your administration is going to allocate the resources and manage the day-to-day -day operations that are also in line with that. And so let's dive in a little bit more and start talking about policymaking. Okay, this is one of the big responsibilities of a board, right? They're a governing body. They're in charge of policy. So as it says here, the board makes or revises policy and is responsible for oversight and the implementation of that policy is on your administration. So once a board passes a policy, that's the what, that's the big picture. Your administration is going to then take that and have to figure out all of the processes and all of the procedures that go along with that. Um, so a quick example here that we have, you know, every um, district's going to have a, an, uh, a, a policy about attendance, right? It's going to be high level. In Cincinnati Public Schools, this is one of the sentences from it. The purpose of the policy is to outline acceptable purposes for which a student may be excused from school, to allow for the appropriate recording of student attendance, and the ability of the district to determine students who are truant. Big picture, right? That's big picture what? We say all the time, we should not be writing um, practice or procedure into policy. So it doesn't say how this is gonna happen, it just says what. So then it is on your administration to figure out the how, how is this gonna happen? So they're gonna take that attendance policy. They're gonna communicate out to all of us, the families, what to do if your child misses school. They're gonna set up the procedure so that you know the teachers and the office staff know how to mark someone late. They're going to know the processes for reporting to authorities if someone's truant. So that's that difference between the what and the how. And so you'll often hear that referred to as the difference between policy and practice. This is really important because if you email your school board or you go talk to your school board about something and it's a practice or a procedural change that you're concerned about, they're going to just bump you over to the administration. They're going to say, we can't do anything about this and vice versa. And so again, right back to what I just said, if you're going to be an effective advocate, you have to know who's got the power to change the thing. So policymaking is such a key function of the board that quite frankly, that's why school boards are under attack right now. Um, so for example, when I was on the Cincinnati school board, we actually did an equity audit where we looked through all of our policies through an equity lens to see where we might inadvertently be reinforcing inequities. And then we systematically went through those policies and we revised them all. And so we know policy can be used to build more equitable districts, to open up access and opportunities for kids. Or like we're seeing now, policy can be used to take us back. Um, and so that is why it's so important to know that policy is a key lever for change and it's under the control of your administration. So I'd love to bring Laura in because she's sitting in one of these school board roles right now. So Laura, talk to us a little about any examples from your time on the school board where policy either helped build more equity in your district or where you realized, oh gosh, our policy is actually restricting access or opportunity. Yeah, um, there are a couple that came to mind. And first of all, I should say that when I was deciding to run for school board and also when I became a school board, board member, I had all of these same questions for at least of and said, what is my job? How am I supposed to do this? So I, I am excited to see see how I'm doing. At least if I can actually give you a little bit of a grade of <laughs> How I'm doing on this. Um, but the first one that I was thinking about was we, um, as, a, as a school board in Shaker Heights, historically have not taken any compensation. Seems like a funny one, right? Like it's, you know, coming from like great intentions, right? Like we don't want to take any money away from districts. I should also be clear, we are not talking about a lot of money that any school board members are making. I think it's a $125 per board meeting, so which can go in our case, on average five hours. Um, so it's not exactly a, a huge um, investment and um, and also not something that politically makes a ton of sense for a school board to take on because it looks like you're just trying to take money. However, what that meant was who felt like they could join a school board and who felt they like they couldn't join the school board. The school board. So if you had kids and had to worry about um, babysitting and making sure someone was going to be with those with your kids every other Tuesday night or whatever time your, your district comes together. 
and you didn't feel like you had the resource to do that, you couldn't take on running for the school board. And um, and what that meant is, although our school board is fairly racially diverse, it is not socio socioeconomically diverse. And so one of the policies that we took on this year was to actually change it so that the, the next round of school board members, and since I'm not running this year, I don't get to take advantage of this until I run again, which actually makes it a little bit politically easier to get past. Um, but we did change that. So that's one of the ones I was thinking about. The other one I was thinking about was um, we had just changed our um, student information system, which actually brought up a whole bunch of questions around what happens if a student fails a class and they take it again. When our systems were terrible, it, it, there was really no question because whenever they took it again, that became their grade. But now we had to decide, do you have to take it again in person for that grade to be the one that wins on the transcript? Can it be online? And again, this doesn't feel like such a big thing, but then we started to think about which kids can access coming in person, which kids can't access that. Who are we, you know, who whose transcript ends up looking better when they are getting ready to apply for their first job or to apply to college and whose transcripts don't. And so that was another one that we actually are still in the midst of kind of thinking through. Um, but I would say from an equitable standpoint, I would love to see that policy be that if you take it again in any way, um, that we would say, yes, that new that new grade will count as your final transcript. Thank you, Laura. Those are both such great examples. And again, when we say looking at something through an equity lens, I know someone chatted in like that's a great example for the one about school board members being paid that I think most people would not have thought of. Um, and so thank you for that one. Um, yes. And of course, like that makes a lot of sense of like who has access to different kinds of of curriculum and courses. Um, thank you for those great examples. Let's move on to another function of the board. So one of the other functions that's really important is budget and finances. Um, so uh, the school board, as it says here, they generally oversee and approve the budget, but the administration, which is gonna be led by your district's treasurer, they're the ones who are allocating the resources, allocating those financial resources. So as it says here, what you've probably heard a lot of is that your school board, as your elected officials, one of their main duties is to be good stewards of taxpayer dollars. To be clear, that does not mean they should be going line by line through a budget. <laughs> that is not their job, right? So again, like we said on the first slide when we were talking about this, the board and the administration have together set their vision and set their priorities. And so how this should work is that now that the administration knows the priorities, they should be bringing a budget to the board that's aligned with those goals and with those priorities. And so as we think about how do we build more equitable districts, the budget is one of those really key levers. Um, so it's really important to note here too, that again, like Maya said when she introduced me, we passed one of the first equity policies in the country here in Cincinnati, and it specifically calls out our budgeting processes. Um, because there's a big difference between budgeting equally and budgeting equitably. And so that is definitely one place we want you all as you're leaving tonight to be thinking about, about how is my district doing this? And I know Annie's going to chat in a link to our equity policy in case that's something you want to check out and see, does my district have an equity policy? One of the really important things we want you to understand about budget and finances is that all of this budgeting has to happen in public. So your school board should be building in time to get public input into the budgeting process and a place for you all to weigh in. And to be clear, you do not need to be experts in public finance. I do not know many people who are. <laughs> you can come to your budget here, your district's budget hearing with you know, giving input on what priorities you think the district should be spending money on. So for example, we know there's a student mental health crisis coming out of, of the pandemic happening across our country. If that's something that you're concerned about, you can go to your district's budget hearing and you can ask, I'd like to, to know more about how the district is allocating funding to address mental health needs like counseling and mindfulness and social emotional learning. And so that's a really important place where you can have some input into the budgeting process. So we'd love to hear from Laura again. So since approving 
and monitoring the budget is such an important part of being a school board member. Can you talk to us about how your district gets community input? And then for the people who joined us tonight, how they might get some of their priorities for fi financial priorities heard by their board. Yeah, and I just wanna also just highlight, um, making sure that your district has an equity policy is a really good first step. And then obviously making sure your district is then adhering to their equity policy is a good second step um, because it, the dollars really are one of the biggest ways that we can either be living into our um, values around equity or not. Um, we have in Shaker, and I suspect other districts have this too, we have a finance and audit committee. Um, it is um, members of the community that advise the board on what are the things that we're seeing within that, um, with, within either our five-year forecast or what's happening month to month. Um, and part of our charter is that that includes folks that do really get into the details of finance and numbers but that also we have people on our committee that are coming with other lenses, either as um, community members for a long time or parents or folks that have been in education or folks that haven't been. Um, and so that ends up being a really important spot for me to get a lot of information on what matters, what do I need to be focused on? Um, what are some of the numbers that are really gonna stand out to me? And so my first thought is, you know, you know you're sort of sitting there thinking, Maybe I want to run for school board someday, but I'm not sure. That's actually a really good way to get started. And it was the first committee that I um, got on myself as a school board member because I just felt like I need to understand this better myself. Um, so that's one way. The other way is because, as Elise was saying, like this is about prior prioritization. And so um, we hear a lot about where, you know, when an AP class is getting closed because we don't have enough students that are in that AP class, we'll get... We will get emails sometimes not even um, just from alumni and from current students, but um, this past year we even had professors from um, universities that were concerned that students that were in their classes that were so great, they were worried they weren't gonna get that because they were in IP. Um, the reason I, I, I am mentioning this is because we are often as school board members hearing from community in, with, in a very strong voice and it's not necessarily the full community. So one of the reasons why that AP class was getting shut down is that we didn't have enough kids that were signing up for it. Um, but we did have other places where we had students that were really interested in additional coursework. And that would allow us to be able to share, you know, other resources, other classes. And um, and I will say it helps when you hear from both sides. So we had, you know, at that school board meeting, we probably had 10 people that came to give public comment. Um, we, you know, I can't even remember how many emails we got, but it was a lot, which I totally applaud. I mean, there's so much stuff that I wouldn't have known about what this course can help you do or not do. And I think other family members saying, here are some of the things we really want to see our children have access to. Um, but it, it's, it's just incredibly helpful from our standpoint to then think about, okay, so then where should resources be moving towards and where should go away from? Yeah. Thank you, Laura. Those are great examples. I know we used to say sometimes like the, the loudest voices aren't always the majority of voices. And so that is really, your point is a really important one that like we need more people to be speaking up when it comes to this so that you can hear all different sides. Um, so thank you. Those are great examples. Um, okay. Let's talk about a couple of the other things school boards are responsible for. Um, another one is curriculum. So Many constituents uh, don't actually know or actually didn't know until it started making headlines that school boards are responsible for approving curriculum, and that includes textbooks. That's why, again, we know that's why so many school boards are being taken over, because this was a way to ban certain books. And so it's really important to know that your school board is the one who's going to ultimately approve your curriculum. And again, this is where it's important to have an equity policy. And also where it's important, like that first slide says, to know what the priorities are and the vision is for your district, because your curriculum should align with all of those things. And so again, in most districts, how it worked in Cincinnati Public is that we assume as board members that your administrators, it is their day job to know deeply about curriculum. So they're the professionals, they're the experts. We assumed they would come to us with curriculum that was aligned with 
the values of the district that were outlined in that equity policy and the priorities that were set by the district. And so again, if you read through that our, our equity policy, you'll see that we're clear about the values and building a diverse and inclusive and equitable district and our curriculum aligns with that. Um, so I'll tell you, I've got you know two kids in Cincinnati Public. Last year, my kids were, I have twins. So when I refer to them as like, they were in eighth grade, that's why um, they were in eighth grade. And my daughter uh, in her language arts class or her English class, they had to pick a social justice book from a list of like 20 different books to do a book report on. And um, we got to you know see and approve all of the different choices. And it was everything from John Lewis's March uh, to Mouse to Being Jazz. I mean, these are literally books that were being banned in other districts were the ones that were being presented to my kids as options to read. And I'll tell you, I felt incredibly grateful to live in a district where my child was gonna be exposed to this kind of literature and these kinds of stories. I did email the teacher to say that. And my daughter was like horrified. Like, yeah, there's nothing more embarrassing for an eighth grader than that to have happened. But it was worth it to say thank you. I'm Thank you for presenting my daughter with, with these materials. Um, but we know not everyone on this uh, session tonight on this Zoom is in that position. And so would love to hear again from Laura. We know so many school boards um, where some of the members are vocal that they don't want to allow discussions in classrooms around issues of equity and inclusion and hearing diverse stories. And so when we think about curriculum, when we think about textbooks, can you talk to us a little about the challenges um, that school board members face when not everyone agrees on the values or how to live out those values in your district? And then also like what could constituents who are living in those districts do about it? Yeah, I mean, I do have to say this is, um, there's many times when we're sort of looking at things that are happening statewide in Ohio that I am very grateful that I am in Shaker Heights. There is, um, this is actually one of those things that has not been a, um, it hasn't been a real challenge within our local community. I will say our, we have um, been working over the last few years to end tracking in our district. And that, although not exactly curriculum, has a whole bunch of other equity considerations to it. So in fifth grade, um, kids were getting tracked. And depending on whether they were honors or not, would, depend, would then um, decide what diplomas they could get when mm -hmm. they graduating from high school. So basically decisions that were being made at nine and 10 year old, 10, nine and 10 year old kids were having that kind of impact. And then we just know there's so much bias in the system. And so therefore you could see pretty clearly white kids and Asian kids were getting tracked into honors at a much higher level than black kids and kids of color. And, um, and certainly along socioeconomic, uh, socioeconomic lines as well. Um, so one of the things that we've been doing is to end tracking. And I will say there's a lot of people very concerned about it, right? They're concerned that for their kid that, you know, should have been in that honors class, are they not getting the same sort of rigor and support that they've gotten before? And again, this is an area where hearing both viewpoints is really helpful because we've, you know, I remember when I was running, talking to a family that had, um, they were black and they you know, talked about how hard it was to get their kid to even get tested to be into the honors classes. Um, we actually had been in a Jewish day school right before this. So when we came in as I identify as a white woman, my kids are white. Um, when we came in, they said, which class do you want, which classes do you want to be in? So like that was such a different experience. I should also note that their son is now at Harvard. So <laughs> he probably should have been in the honors. Um, but so I'm really proud of the work the district's doing in doing around this. And again, like hearing voices from people who have been affected by some of those decisions, I think are really important. Um, but the other thing I just think about when, um, like, you know, what do you do if you're in one of those those places where there is book banning that is happening, or there's people that are really concerned that um, you might be infecting their child by sharing information about how people live their lives. Um, I again, like showing up at board meetings, writing letters to the school board, and also writing op eds in whatever lo local papers you have. Um, for us, actually, the student newspaper is one of the um, most well read publications that are in Shaker. And so, um, so also writing op eds for the student paper, all of those things actually make a really big difference. Those are great ideas, Laura. And I think when we talk about curriculum, we don't often think of tracking in terms of what curriculum is being our kids being exposed to. 
So that's a great example. And then I love all of those ways that you can actually make your, your voice voice heard, including the student newspaper. That's fantastic. Um, okay, let's talk about the last couple of things that our school board members are responsible for. Um, okay, so two more points, and then we're going to check in on all we've learned so far. So it's really important to understand that the school board only hires and manages the superintendent, and here in Ohio, the treasurer, and then sometimes a couple other roles depending on your district. So maybe the legal counsel, maybe an internal auditor, but that's it. Everybody else is hired and evaluated by your administrative team. Um, and that's really important because I know when I was a school board member, I, I think probably the most common thing people came to me with, whether they were sliding over to talk to me at one of my kids' soccer games or stopping me at Kroger, was they had a concern about a specific teacher or a specific principal. And that's really hard because that's not my job. Um, and so what I would always do is listen because the number one job I do have as the as a, as a school board member is to listen to my community. So I would always listen. And then I would say, I'm going to, I'm going to take that concern and I'm going to make sure that I get it to the superintendent. So I'd get their email address I would email the superintendent, the question or the concern with the person and say, can you please take care of this for them? Um, but that is really important to know again, if there's something happening to, uh, that you're concerned about who actually controls that thing. And then finally, but probably most importantly, um, the board represents you, the community, and they report to you. So that means, as Laura just said, they should be hearing from you and they should be listening to you as they make their decisions. So all those examples Laura just gave, you can email them, you can talk at a school board meeting, you can write an op-ed. Doing all of those things is really powerful um, because that's their job. They report to you. So that was a lot. We're gonna do a little activity to, to see what stuck. Um, okay, so remember, big picture, what we want you to remember is your board is the what, your administration is the how. Here's how this is gonna work. Um, Annie is gonna do some more polls for us. She's gonna put a question up on the screen. You are going to decide if you think it's a uh, school board controls it, if the administration controls it, or you can say that you don't know. We say all the time at school board school, we're always learning. So it's totally fine to say like, I don't know, you you people just said a lot of things to me. I'm not sure, I'm not sure which one of these. So um, we're gonna see how much we already know. So Annie, will you launch that first poll? Okay, who determines an individual school's specific dress code? For example, if they wear uniforms or not, do you think it's the board or the administration or you just don't know? We'll give you just a few more seconds. See, I knew I was going to also get tested. This is helpful for me too. <laughs> See, this is what we mean. We're all always learning. Okay. It looks like we've got most of the answers in, and it looks like most of you got this one. This one is the administration. So this one is about implementation. So your board's going to have a dress code policy that should be high level. They're going to determine the what. High level, what do we think is acceptable dress codes for our district? But then each school is going to determine the how. So some schools might want uniforms, others don't. And so this is a really important one to understand that the big picture is the board and then how it gets implemented in each school that's on your administration. Okay, next question. This one's really important given what's happening around the country, but who decides if the consideration of controversial issues has a legitimate place in the instructional program of the schools? Do you think that's a what or a how? Who decides the consideration of controversial issues if that has a legitimate place in the schools? All right, I think we did a pretty good job on this one. Oh, a couple more votes are still coming in. Okay, this one is the board and it looks like most of you got this one. That's because this is a what. What gets to be discussed in the schools? The how, how are these controversial issues gonna get discussed? That is up to each school, right? So it might be obviously different if you're a preschool site or if you're an elementary or if you're a high school, like how are things gonna be discussed? 
is determined by each individual school. Um, and, you know, in Cincinnati Public, we actually have a policy called controversial issues. It's on your handout and um, Annie will chat in the link to it. it. It's really important. We would actually suggest that you check if your district has a policy like this, because then when things come up, there's a policy to point to. It's not just arbitrary about what we actually are and aren't allowed to talk about in our schools. We're going to do one more. Um, this one. You have a concern about your child's teacher. You've spoken to the principal, but nothing's changed. Do you go to a school board member or someone in the administration? Ah, uh, the answers are flying in for this one. All right, great job. Everybody got this one. Yes, okay. So important to remember that your board is only the uh, only oversees your superintendent and your treasurer. If you have concerns about anyone else, you're going to your administration. All right, so we wanna make sure we have time to um, cover a whole bunch of more stuff still here too, as we talk about candidates. So we're gonna move on. If you have any questions about the stuff Laura and I have talked about so far, um, please just like hold anything to the end. I'm gonna stick around for what we like to call the after party. So if anyone has any questions, we can we can answer some more of them then. Um, one quick thing we are gonna chat in though, is we always wanna make sure you're learning to take action. And so we're gonna chat in a link to a website um, called XQ. And if you don't know when your school board meets next, you can find your school board meeting by using this link. All right, so check that out. It's also in your handout. Okay, so now that we know what a school board member actually does and doesn't do, like I said, we wanna apply that learning. So here in Ohio, we know it's a school board election year. We're sure you all know that are on this call. We also know there's often a difference between people who are really good at campaigning and people who are actually good at governing. So we want you all to know what questions you should ask these candidates to know, are they actually going to be good at the job? So we're going to start by hearing some from Laura. So Laura, as a school board member yourself, when you go to vote, what do you look for in candidates? Yeah, I mean, so we haven't talked that much about what's coming from the state, but there is an onslaught of um, potential legislation, legislation, um, policy decisions that are coming from the state all the time. So one of the things that um, I want to know is that they're actually paying attention to what's happening at the state level in addition to what's happening in the in in our own sort of local community. Um, I think the other, you know, I think like at this moment in terms of thinking about the state, there is a real push. Um, and I think Karen actually talked about this in the beginning, but a real push. Um, sorry, I think Susan talked about it in the beginning around privatizing education. Um, so the budget this past year included basically universal vouchers. Um, we get money from the OFCC to do work around our buildings. That money is is going to end up including private schools soon too. So I also want to know what their feelings are around private, privatization of schools, school accountability. What, what do we believe to be true for our public schools? Um, and then the other thing is what I have noticed with candidates is to what extent can they extrapolate their own experience to the larger community or to what extent are they talking to people that might have had different experiences. Um, so a school board candidate that's spending a lot of time talking about their own kid is, I mean, that's fine, but I really want to know what does that mean in terms of how you are going to govern for all kids. Um, I will say in general, like the questions that I ask are are very much around tell me what you have done as opposed to what you will do. Um, this is something that I just think is really important to understand to your comment, Elisa, some people are really good at campaigning. So some people can say all sorts of things right now. But, you know, I really want to know, tell me about a time you advanced equity in our community. That would be a question that's you know, certainly something that would be really important to me. Even just the question of like, why do we want to serve? Um, actually tells you a lot about what their priorities are and also um, what you know they're going to stay focused on as we continue to to you know govern together potentially. Um, so I would say those are sort of the biggies for me. That's great. And I think, Laura, you already threw one question out there you would ask. Are there any other questions that you ask 
um, when you think about like, okay, I've got a couple minutes with these candidates. Here are the here are the specific questions I'm going to ask them. Yeah, I mean, I I really am kind of checking to see how much homework they've already done. Like, do they really want to be doing this work? So um, there's sort of like some easy things that you can say without having a lot of evidence behind it. And so I'll just keep asking a few more questions like, oh, well, so, you know, tell me about the board meetings that you've had a chance to listen to. What were some of your reflections from that? It's pretty awkward if they've never come to any of those board meetings. And, and you know, I think probably lots of communities have um, live streaming at this point. So it's fine if I've never seen them in a board meeting, but I want to know that they're actually engaged in that way. Um, I also really want to know what have they been doing during their campaign in terms of where they're spending their time. Um, so, you know, there's Shaker's not huge, but we have a lot of very specific neighborhoods within Shaker. Cincinnati obviously is a lot bigger, um, but I want to make sure that they've actually had a chance to be in all of our neighborhoods and get a chance to hear from a much more diverse set of folks that will have lots of, it's about education and um, and what they want from our school. Yeah, I think those are all so important. I know in the past, sometimes when I've asked candidates about, you know, tell me a little about the meetings you've been to and what you've heard um, and what we're missing out, like what we're not talking about. And I've discovered that they haven't actually been to meeting, any meetings, not, not, and, and, and you think, huh, like, how are you, how do you, how do you know what the work is that we're doing right now and what you want to do differently if you've not been? And I'm not saying you have to come every single meeting, but like, have you gone to enough that like Laura's saying, you actually know what the topics are, you're ready to jump in and you know what else that's not being talked about that you do want to address. Um, yep. That's great. Um, okay. So to everybody who's here tonight, after hearing about what a school board does and doesn't do after hearing from Laura about what she would ask candidates, we want you to start applying this learning. So Given what you know now, knowing that there's an election right now, you've got candidates in all of your districts who are right now out there asking for your vote. We want you to chat in. What is one question that you are going to ask school board candidates in your district? Let's take a minute to think about it, and then let's have everyone go ahead and start chatting them in. What's one question you're going to ask school board candidates in your district? As people are thinking about that, uh, the other thing I think about is going to a school board member that you do respect and you um, often agree with how they're leading and thinking about work, asking them who are some of the people that are standing out to them as potential school board members can also be a helpful way to get your head around what I should be asking. That's a great, great advice. Yep. And I know, especially, you know, given how hard it is to get work done when five or seven people have to work together. I always ask about, you know, tell me about a time where maybe you were at work or in a family situation where you disagreed with how something was being done. How did you address that? So really seeing how well do people work together? How do you work together with other people is one I always ask about. Um, okay. So they're coming in now. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts regarding the current equity policy? If your district has one, um, oh my gosh, yes, superintendent hiring. It is one of the most important things your board members will do. So thank you to, to the person who chatted that one in. What qualities and experiences are you looking for in a new superintendent? And then right along those same lines, thank you, Michael. What are your measures to evaluate the superintendent? Oh my gosh, this is one that most districts do not have specific measures around. That is such a great one. These are great questions. Um, yep, ensuring... Uh, what are the district's priorities for ensuring safety of students? Um, I'm getting choked up reading that one. As my team knows, uh, there was a bomb threat at my child's school today. And so, um, yes, that is a lot right now. And yes, like how do we actually keep our kids safe in the wild world we're living in right now? Yep. Um, oh, social emotional learning. What role should schools be playing? What are the top priorities for our school system? These are great questions. So, um, these are all fantastic. Uh, and so I what we hope you'll do over the next few minutes is scroll through these questions and jot some down that you want to make sure that you're going to ask candidates in your district. Use this opportunity of having 40 something people's brains working together um, to really 
um, use the the thoughts and the ideas that they came up with as well. So please do take a little bit of time, read through these, jot some down that you're going to ask candidates in your district too. Um, while you're doing that, we're going to tell you we've got a bunch of other tools and resources for you to use as you're thinking about what should I ask candidates. These are all in your handout, but we do want to give a quick voiceover of them. So the league has a bunch of great resources. So one of them, they put together a bunch of questions that you can use if you want to put together a candidate guide in your district. So I know some districts already have those. If yours doesn't, you can make one. So use theirs. You can also check out um, Vote411, that website, to see everybody who's on your ballot. Sometimes it's hard to even know who is running. So please use Vote411 to figure that out. And then you'll also see in your handout a link to a document the league put together called Preparing to Vote. This has everything you need to do to get ready to go vote for school board. So huge kudos to the league for putting that together. We also included links to our Cincinnati Public Schools guide and forum that we put together. So if you're in Cincinnati Public, please use that. If you're not in Cincinnati Public, you can also still open those and see the questions we asked because those might be questions that you wanna ask in your district also. And then the last thing we're gonna chat in is we're gonna chat in a link to the doc a document called Eight Characteristics of Effective Boards. So this was research that was done on what distinguishes effective school boards from those that are not as effective. Um, and if these are the things that make good school boards, you should use this as you're thinking about what questions you're gonna ask school board members. Um, so we've chatted all that in. Um, the last thing we want to talk about is we also know that, you know, school board members are so important, as we all just talked about for almost an hour tonight, um, but that historically school board elections have really low voter turnout. We need you all, all 42 of us on this call, we need you all to help change that. So if you're in great election awareness campaign um, here in Cincinnati. And so what you can do is you can volunteer on our campaign. So you can come knock doors, you can write postcards, you can work a poll on election day. You don't have to live in CPS. We need lots of boots on the ground. Um, if you're not here in greater Cincinnati, please check. What's the inside day ever, Leo? What the funny day to adding forever? Does the grass go like 10.30 and all? Sorry about that. Um, this is one of the downfalls of having teenagers, you all. My son's AirPods just connected to my computer, so I just had to turn that off. <laughs> um, okay. He was probably like, what on earth am I listening to? This does not sound like my YouTube video. Um, okay. Anyway, <laughs> um, so please volunteer on our election awareness campaign. If you're not in CPS, we have a page on our website called Election Action with a bunch of actions you can take. Um, but let's share the slides one more time, and let's go over a couple of actions that anyone from anywhere can take. So first of all, whoops. Let's see, as those are going up, I'll just start talking about them. So first of all, what you can do is you can volunteer on the campaign for a candidate that you support. Oh my gosh, Laura and I can tell you as candidates ourselves, it is so much work. We need so much help. So find a candidate who you support and go volunteer on their campaign. You can also spread the word to your network. So use your social media, post information linking to reputable sites like Vote411 to get the word out there that there's an election, here's why it's important to vote. You can hold a friend raiser where you bring friends together and you know have pizza together and talk about it. Um, Whenever you can, at your book club, at wherever, wherever you can, wherever you are, talk about this election. And then spread the word beyond your network. So I know Laura talked about writing op-eds. We just had two of our members of School Board School co-author an op-ed together, where one lives in the suburbs of Cincinnati, the other in CPS, and they talked about how no matter where you live, it's important to vote. So spread the word beyond your network um, and really help people understand why this is important to democracy as a whole. And then finally, bring some friends to the polls, right? So it's important that you go vote, but also when you're on your way to go vote, text a couple of friends. Have you voted for school board yet? If not, do you want me to pick you up? Um, get those friends in the car with you, volunteer to drive friends to the poll. 
um, share some information and make sure you get people to come out and vote for this important election. All right. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to turn it back over to Maya and she is going to close us out. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Laura. That was amazing. And even I learned a few things and I've been doing this for a little bit. So hopefully you now understand the role of the school board and have a good list of questions to ask candidates. There were so many good questions in the chat. We have a few more resources to share, but before we do, we're going to put another poll, the same one we did that we started with, with the same objectives, and let's see how we're feeling now. And say whether you agree or strongly agree. I can distinguish between the role of a school board, which is governance, and the district administration's role, which is management. And don't forget to scroll down. There are three questions there. The second one about knowing what questions to ask, and then the last one about believing your school board members should be listening to you. All right, well, look, looks good. Like when we think about where we were when we started to where we are now, we've got almost everybody who strongly agrees or agrees um, with our first objective about understanding the roles. And same thing for knowing what questions to ask. Yep, and for that, all right, looks like most of us net agree on all of these. That is great progress for just an hour together. Great job, everyone. All right, so a few things before we close out. First, we have a page of resources on our website called Advocacy Tools. We think it'll be really helpful for you. Well, the link is on your handout. We're gonna chat it in now. If you wanna open it and save the link. Finally, like we said at the beginning, we always wanna learn so we can take action. So we wanna hear your action commitment. So go ahead and chat in your answer to something I learned tonight will help me link. So this could be something I learned tonight will help me show up at my next school board meeting or know what questions to ask. Shout it in. All right. As we, I'm going to let you guys chug in as it goes. There we go. Okay, we have the difference between board and superintendent. Knowing who's responsible for what, very big thing. Better understanding of the rules. There's a lot of time, great advice, and someone wants to share this webinar with friends. So yeah, go ahead and take the handout and share the handout in the reporting with friends. I want to say a big thank you to Laura and Elisa for sharing their time and experience with us. Thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. If you want to learn more about School Board School and other sessions like this that we host, sign up on our website. We also want to uh, we'll also chat in the link. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So I want to, on behalf of the league, thank our partners here at School Board School for spending their time. Uh, I want to call a shout out to Annie Cervenka and Linnea Mustafa for managing the most difficult part, which makes it possible for us all to be here. Um, and I think it would be really helpful, perhaps if the state legislature took this course so they would understand the difference between their roles and the roles of local school districts. It's something that I think is the, the real challenge is not so much the internal managing of, the, of our school districts, but making sure everybody's really playing the roles they're supposed to play. So 
going forward, there's plenty more to learn and think about. And I just once again want to thank people and make sure we all vote and look forward to all those materials and use them. So um, may public schools thrive. Thank you all.